Is the American dream dead? Is the American dream dead? Dead? People say it is. Only one out of four Americans still believe in the American dream. Why is that? Lemonade for sale, 50 cents. Maybe because there are so many rules that it's almost impossible for me to sell lemonade legally. Too much is illegal. I wasn't allowed to bake and sell anymore. Yet despite the obstacles, people keep creating from silly things like a bar with market prices. A new food. Two million dollars in sale. And all sorts of grand ideas. You want to buy Fox t-shirt? To me, the most patriotic thing you can do as an American is be filthy, filthy rich. Risky business. There's a time for playing it safe. And a time for risky business. That's our show tonight. Just take those old John Stossel. Risky business. For those of you who know the Tom Cruise movie, movie, I want to be clear, our show tonight is not about running a brothel in your home. We'll talk about other risky businesses. And actually, all business is risky because most fail. But that process of trying and failing and maybe failing again, but then sometimes succeeding is what made America prosperous. Many people call it the American dream. But now I'm told the American dream is dead. You can't just make it if you try. The American dream is dead. Really? I assume that's just the victim mentality that's all over the left-wing media. But conservative economist David Goldman also says the American dream is dead. Well, John, it's not dead. It's under an evil spell like Sleeping Beauty. We can get it back, but people are not perceiving entrepreneurship and innovation affecting their lives the way it did in the past. Really? Because I am. I see it all around. Maybe I'm biased because I work at Fox Business, no, but I see all kinds of people well, with new ideas. You're biased because you've got a job. It's just one simple <laughs> fact. The Russell 2000 companies, which are smaller, you know, expanding companies, have half the number of jobs they did before the 2008 financial crisis because the United States government has done everything possible to make it hard for people to take a new idea from inception to startup to expansion. Because they keep passing more rules. Absolutely. Just before the show, I had lunch with the former chairman of one of the largest home furnishings chain, and I told him I'd be on the show, and he said, just tell him, shut Washington down. That's all we need to do. Well, uh, good luck with that. You also say globalization makes it tougher. I would think it would make it easier. You get customers all over the world. Globalization increases the threshold, John. So you need to hire the people overseas. You need the marketing people, the government relations people, the translators and you, so forth. government relations people. Well, when you're dealing with a lot of countries, particularly in the developing sector, which is where a lot of the growth is coming from, dealing with governments is an art, not a science. Uh, I interviewed one billionaire who's a good example of someone who's achieved the American dream. When Mark Cuban was 24 years old, he had no money and no job prospects, so he created several companies. I just worked, I mean, literally all night, all night every night. To me, the most patriotic thing you can do as an American is be filthy, filthy rich. You're creating jobs. You're creating opportunities. Cuban started the company CompuServe. Then he started HDNet and Broadcast.com. He sold that company to Yahoo for six billion dollars. Now he hosts a TV show that invites entrepreneurs to pitch ideas and sometimes invest in them. Five hundred thousand dollars for 45 percent of the company. It's exciting, and his show's a hit, but they probably stole the idea from this old PBS show. Looking for money to grow. We call it Money Hunt. He's got a product that's very good, but what will make it market differentiatable? I love the idea for your business, and I just want to reposition your entire company already. Every time you think this guy has just gone over the rainbow, he keeps sucking you back in. The speaker there was entrepreneur Miles Spencer. Here he is, uh, almost 20 years later. And now you don't just give him advice, you're investing in companies. Uh, that's correct, both, uh, both cash and what most importantly is the mentorship and advice, team building and leadership. So what about this theme, the dream is dead? 
Well, absolutely not. I don't, I don't think the dream is dead. I think it certainly dies in certain sectors. Creative destruction is what built this uh, uh, country, and uh, that's what many companies are built upon. So every time a dot-com failed a few years ago, uh, a decade ago indeed, there was a Google that emerged. All right, so one business featured on Miles' old PBS show was Pirate Brands. They make uh, stuff like Smart Puffs, Pirate Booty. Uh, Miles gave the CEO advice, and apparently you helped him. A couple of seasons ago, he came on this show doing $2 million in sales. He waltzes back in here at 17, headed to 25. Uh, that turned out to be one of the program's big successes. They just uh, sold out to some big food company. Uh, B&G Foods, as a matter of fact, Robert was a tremendous entrepreneur, but really a, a scientist who could create very uh, tasty treats, but needed the team building and leadership and mentorship that allowed his business to grow. And so my but office, if, if it's tasty, I'm doing a commercial for it, yeah. wouldn't it just succeed because it tastes better? Isn't that all you have to do? Um, that's a quaint thought, I suppose, uh, but today it's, as you said, a global economy. It's an economy that competes across so many different categories, so it is crucial to have great marketing, great product, and so it's not just about a, a one-trick pony anymore. Any other successes you found on your PBS show? There was one particular company, Register.com, which was so good, actually, we, um, we did invest in them. We put them on as an expert. Deutsche Bank took them public for about a billion four in 2000. Failures? Tons of them. As a matter of fact, there was one, there was one entrepreneur that uh, we wrote a check about six figures uh, on the show, and I think the money was gone before the commercial break. And and, <laughs> and, and per your uh, that was the dot com bubble. It, it was the dot com bubble, and you know there there are other shows out there today that um, a, a lot of entrepreneurs try to pitch and, and, and get a check and wrangle a check out of predators uh, after 20 minutes. But the reality is, it takes a lot more to build a business than just a 20 minute pitch. But as I can feel as you talk about this, there's an excitement there. I feel it around here at Fox Business that being an entrepreneur, taking the risk, trying something, it just builds adrenaline. I, I absolutely thrive upon the adrenaline. And part of the adrenaline is that when you invest, odds are you'll fail. Oh, 80% of them fail in the first year, 10% in the second, and I think five in the third. So you got five companies left standing out of 100 after three years. But the five have to be profitable enough to pay for the 95 failures. And then some. Uh, so I mentioned one of my hits, and that would pay for 10, 15, 25 failures. I'm also an entrepreneur. I used to be an executive at Bank of America. Now I work for a two-year-old startup, Hong Kong investment bank. I love entrepreneurship. The question is, are ordinary Americans seeing the benefits of entrepreneurship in a way they did in the past? In the Reagan administration, most jobs were created by startups. Big companies lost jobs. In the Obama administration, the Russell 2000 has half the jobs. Most of the jobs are coming from big companies. The kind of confidence that ordinary Americans have that entrepreneurship would improve their lives has been lost. Where'd you have more fun, at the big company or this little Small one? company, no question. <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about our, our current president. He seems a little schizophrenic about business. In 2011, he said this. America's always been a nation of doers. We build things. We take risks. And we believe that if you have a good idea and are willing to work hard enough, you can turn that idea into a successful business. Yes, but then two years later, he said this. If you've been successful, you, don't, you didn't get there on your own. If you got a business, that, you didn't build that. What's that about? I mean, well, two years there, later, this is there, politics? There is a kernel of truth in what Obama is saying. All the technologies that transformed the American economy in the 1980s and 1990s had some government participation. Microchips, microwaves, lasers, all of these things Some, came, but, but a small amount. Well, the big point here is government doesn't pick who succeeds or fails. It's the, it's the free market that does that. That's Absolutely. what's so great about entrepreneurship. And yes, it is much more ex exciting to start a business than to run uh, tend to work for a large company. Now the president says it's government's job to help businesses succeed. I've called on my entire administration to help entrepreneurs get loans, cut through red tape, speed up innovation, and get their businesses off the ground faster. What? They've done the opposite. They pass a thousand new rules every week. All those rules are obstacles to entrepreneurship. When I interviewed Mark Cuban, he said under today's rules, he could not have built the businesses he once built. A lot of these things now, there's so much paperwork and regulation, so many things that you have to sign up for that 
you have a better chance of getting in trouble than you do of being successful. And this is what upsets me when the, my president says, we're going to help people get loans. Like, they're going to pick and choose? Well, I don't know whether the government wants to be our partner here. Um, government isn't the partner uh, that I think of. I mean, the partners that I think of are sweating payroll, are working with me the late hours over the weekend, are developing products. Uh, someone that shows up uh, on, in April on one day and uh, wants a dividend check is, isn't a partner. The left now says income inequality, which is big in America that that's a threat to the American dream. No one cares if Bill Gates becomes a gazillionaire if their life improves. The problem is median household income is down by 10% in the last 10 years. The threat to the American dream is that people are not making the kind of money they had in the past, didn't have the kind of opportunities. The fact that so few people get rich has nothing to do with that. It's a question of how they get rich. People get rich by creating new companies and new products which benefit everybody. That's the dream. Nobody cares. That's the dream. The equality issue is a complete red herring. Now, there's something called CB Research that has a death chart. Tell me about that. Uh, yeah, occasionally I use the death chart actually to... to, to to assess what kind of an industry I might like to invest in next, right? And it is the statistical analysis of how many businesses have started within certain industries and how many have failed within those industries. Those are the ones you probably want to stay away from. Well, at the top here, social media, that's booming. So I don't uh, get it. Yeah, category killer, uh, Facebook. Uh, there were thousands of other social media businesses that were spawned in competition to that. For the most part, many of them have been wiped out, gone, wouldn't invest in that today. LinkedIn had a column 10 reasons you have to quit your job which went viral um, everyone is an entrepreneur it's one of the arguments abundance will never come from your job this says the dream is alive go do it and well I, I certainly think so being an entrepreneur and creating businesses is so much better than than um, working at your job having said that it's not for everyone. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of lumpiness. There's a lot of risk, which is the title of this segment. So yeah, I'm checking. Uh, most people are not entrepreneurs. An entrepreneur is someone How do we pronounce it? We pronounce it two different ways here. Who's uh, right? Uh, tomato, potato, tomato, potato. Absolutely. An entrepreneur knows that his perpetual motion machine is going to make him a trillion dollars with absolute certainty. They've got complete faith in their projects. 90% of so them are So a good wrong. entrepreneur is deluded. 90% <laughs> of them are going to lose their shirts and the 10% are going to make our lives better. Most people do not have the faith in themselves and the vision to be entrepreneurs. That's why most of us ought to be working for those entrepreneurs who do have the competence and the vision. There's a great saying, uh, gr you know, many great young entrepreneurs didn't know what they couldn't do. <laughs> and final thought, Amazon, I learned, will now pay employees $5,000 to quit? That's a leave bonus. I've done it in my companies after 90 days. If someone doesn't espouse our core values, if someone isn't actually got their wheel to Motivated the grindstone. Motivated to it, do a exa good job. Exactly. Then they're going to become cancer and they're going to affect others within the organization. And we're growing businesses very quickly. We can't run fast on, on a bad wheel. So we, we offer people uh, a leave bonus. Um, after 90 days. Thank you, Miles Spencer, David Goldman. Thank you, Keep John. this conversation going on Facebook or Twitter. Use that hashtag risky business. Let biz actually let people know what you think. Coming up more risky business like a bar where the price of booze fluctuates like the stock market. You can really get a good deal on a drink if you catch it at the right time. I'm gonna cause a market crash. Oh, oh, oh. But next, look at these delicious desserts. They were made by this 12-year-old at her mom's kitchen. But when she sold some, government demanded that she stop. She's here to explain next. Lemonade for sale, lemonade for sale. That's me making a fool of myself just outside this studio. I tried to sell lemonade legally, but I couldn't do it. Fox lawyers let me do this only if I gave people their money back and didn't let anyone drink the lemonade. 
To sell lemonade legally would have taken me months of paperwork. You must complete a 15-hour food protection course, register for a food safety exam, pass it, then register for a sales tax certificate, apply for a temporary food establishment permit, arrange to be inspected by the health department. That takes three weeks just to get an appointment. Then you have to buy a fire extinguisher certified by the government and get a contract for waste disposal and more. I gave up. But I'm optimistic about the future because there are some young Americans who don't give up, who want to fight the entrepreneurship-killing bureaucrat. Chloe Sterling is one of those people. She's 12. She joins us with, with her mom, Heather. So, Chloe, what did you do? You, you took a baking class, and then what happened? Well, about two years ago, I took a baking class, and after that first class, I decided that I really liked to do it, and so when all my friends saw the pictures of them, they decided that they wanted me to bake their cakes and cupcakes for their birthdays and stuff. And then they started paying you for them. Yeah. And Heather, it just grew. It just grew. She kind of found herself in business based on popular demand. And, and she's always like doing this. She, she at eight years old, uh, she, what happened? Eight years old, the iPads came out and she came to me and her dad and said she wanted one. We said no. <laughs> So she decided she was going to earn it, and she started her own pet sitting business that April, and she pet sat all summer long and ended up buying herself an iPad. And at the time, they cost 600 bucks. That's, That's right. a lot of pet sitting. Took her a few months, but she got it. All right, and then the cupcakes, mm -hmm. and it grew, and you were sell selling how many? I was selling probably a dozen a week. She had orders every weekend for booked a month and a half out. How much money? Um... I really don't know. I just knew that I was putting all the money in my savings account. How much money? She doesn't. She doesn't even take money out of the savings account. She's got like more money than most. Well, she probably ten thousand dollars. No, <laughs> no, she probably made, you know, fifty bucks a week, maybe. The local paper did a feature story right. on you, and immediately after that, an email came from the health department saying, to you, to email. mom. Yeah said, um, please call us about your daughter. And when I called, they said, she is not to bake anymore. Do not let another cupcake leave that house. Do not let another cupcake leave the house. Yes. And we asked the Illinois Department of Health about this. Why, why would they shut Chloe down? And what they said was in a statement, Without standard sanitation training, clear labeling of ingredients that could cause potentially fatal allergic reactions, we cannot ensure the safety of foods. So what about that, Chloe? You're, you know, they're just protecting me from you poisoning me. Um, I thought that it was kind of odd that they wouldn't let an 11-year-old bake out of her home and sell it to her friends and family. But you're making money. Yeah, I was making money, but still, I was only 11. Like, I wasn't making, like, a lot of money. She might have poisoned somebody. Um, she's never sold a cupcake to anybody that was not 100% aware that they were buying a cupcake from a, a child that was prepared in her kitchen. Um, everyone that ever ordered anything from her came to her. She's never advertised. She's never had to go look for business. They have come to her willingly, and she's never made anyone sick either. So what's happening now? You're going to give up? No, we're not giving up. We're in the process of trying to change the law so me and other people like me can bake out of their homes. And, and you've made progress. A state representative has uh, gotten the legislature to vote to change the law. Yeah, yeah we've gotten 100% um, of the votes towards us on the committee and the House. And also people are donating commercial kitchen equipment to you? Yeah, the health department, part of the big issue here was there were no options for her. Um, there wasn't an avenue for her to take. If she wanted to bake again, they told us we had to buy a bakery or add an additional kitchen onto our home, um, strictly used for her baking. And they say this with a straight face? With a straight buy face. Buy a bakery? Yes. Add another kitchen? Yes. So lucky for us, um, she's been supported by people all over the country. People volunteer to do carpentry work for you? Yes, we've got uh, we've got one company in particular that's kind of leading the way um, for building Chloe's kitchen. <laughs> this is what it takes to be an entrepreneur in America today. Thank you, Chloe and Heather. Good luck to Thank you. you. Thank you.
Coming up, another entrepreneur who's fighting the bureaucrats, and so far, he's winning. He's defeated these 750 pages of regulations. Some more good news next. You've heard the expression, you can't fight City Hall. People say it for a reason. The bureaucrats have all the time and money in the world. They don't care if you lose your investment or how much time it takes you. It's why they usually win. They pretty much defeated the little girl we met in the last segment, but occasionally an entrepreneur has the resources and will to fight back and win. Greg Garrett did that. He raises oysters on his land, or just off his land in Virginia. You brought me some, thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the, the oysters are, I mean, they taste fantastic. We're, we're serving them up here in New York. We're shipping them to California, all over the country. It's, um, you know, we have great oyster grounds. We're really we're able to secure the prime oyster grounds at the mouth of the York River on the Chesapeake Bay. And, uh, I mean, the county ought to be proud of our oysters. They ought to be proud that they're being shipped all over the country. Well, uh, they taste good. I, I approve. Ten different government permits were required and you got them but then the authorities said it's not enough you misinterpreted our 700 page code of ordinances you'll have to get another permit which we won't give you so you'll just have to shut down yeah three years into the oyster farm we had all the permits from the state and the county said you're violating our zoning ordinance and we're not going to let you continue do you went to circuit court the county, you won there, but then the county took it to the Supreme Court where you lost. Right. And then you tell it. Yeah, well, see, at the Supreme Court, again, they were deciding on a very technical issue about land use, right, which I won't go into. So we lost. So the state legislature said, this is not right. Wherever you can grow buffalo and, and goats and cows and hippopotamuses, you ought to be able to grow oysters. And so the state legislature voted 128 to 5 in a bipartisan pack to a, approve this. A rare act, partly because you're good at getting some publicity like this and the politicians paid attention attention, but they can't do that for every entrepreneur. No, they cannot. But you made a good reference there. Your land was okayed for livestock. Right. Which meant you could have raised, what, pigs and buffalo would have been legal? Perfectly but, legal by the county standards. But oysters, no. And, and the county supervisor uh, didn't respond to our calls, but we found something they wrote. Aquaculture is not a traditional farming activity. Processing and storage can have a significant negative impact on surrounding neighbors due to odors, noise, and traffic. And then what is a pig farm going to have? I'm zoned for a pig farm. I mean, does that have any potential for uh, effect on the neighbors? But in, ca in our case, the oysters are silent. They don't smell. There's no noise. We, the biggest piece of equipment we have is a 7-horsepower power washer. My lawnmower has a 15-horsepower motor. And there are 100, 700 plus pages of rules. Some are crazy. You can't tie up the oyster boat to your dock. Right. We, that's, that's one of the things that they, the Supreme Court ruled that said we cannot tie the, boy, the boat to the dock. So we have to put up PVC pipes a foot away from the dock. And the guys have, the oyster farmers have to jump from the boat to the dock and back and forth. And because they can't conduct the oyster operation on the dock or on the land because the county's claimed zoning jurisdiction over the, over the, plan, over the land and the dock. But the boat's fine because it's out of their jurisdiction. And when you get this many rules, it really means any bureaucrat can cite you for just about anything, anytime. Well, it's like, it's like living in Hazard County, and I'm one of the Duke brothers, because I've come against these people. I have not obeyed them, and uh, two are retired colonels, and they can't be wrong. And so they have made these rules, and they've even changed rules along the way. And they're not giving up, even no. though you've got one in the legislature. No, no, the legislature, again, 128 to 5 is the victory we had at the state level. They're still the coming The governor signed you? it. Oh, yeah, they, I just got served with another lawsuit. How much does this cost you in legal fees? Thousands, thousands, and thousands of dollars. The legal fees actually, most weeks, or many weeks, the legal fees are greater than the entire gross revenue of the oyster farm. If I wasn't in the real estate business and, have a, and had a successful business, I could never fight this. Why don't you just say, okay, I give up? I'm not going to give up. I mean, my, I'm, I, I've, my family has been in this county since 1620, and we've been eating oysters out of that river since 1620, 15 generations. And it's just, it, I'm not going to give up. 
give up. I mean, this is where Cornwallis surrendered, and I'm going to stay here and tell this Board of Supervisors surrendered. This is Yorktown, Virginia, where freedom was won for America. Thank you, Greg Garrett. Uh, America needs people like you who won't give up. Coming up, one entrepreneur says you should maybe quit your job, start a business, do cool and live happily ever after. I'm a coward. My parents told me, you work hard in high school, go to a good college, go to grad school, then you can get a job and you won't freeze in the dark. Made sense to me. So I worked hard in high school, went to college, applied to grad schools, but then I was fortunate to stumble across a job in television. People also say it's good for your personal development to change your job every seven years or so, but I have basically held on to the same job for more than 40 years. Start a business? Wasn't my thing, it seems. Too risky. Maybe I'm not good at predicting what businesses will succeed. When Ted Turner started CNN, I said, no oh, way, that'll work. 24 hours of news, no one can make a profit on that. Oops. <laughs> then when my bosses started another news channel, Fox, I thought, no way, two channels can be profitable. <laughs> Wrong again. And that's why I work for them. And now I realize that my mindset, graduate college, get a job with an established company, is just short-sighted. Today, plenty of people who take that route are deep in debt. On the other hand, surveys show people who run their own businesses tend to be happier. It's a reason Mickey Agrawal wrote a book called Do Cool. <laughs> Mickey went to an Ivy League school and then worked at a prestigious bank, but then you quit. Why? Well, so I actually had an aha moment when I was working at Deutsche Bank in investment banking. 9-11 uh, actually happened, and I was supposed to be there, but the first time in my life, I slept through my alarm clock, and that's when I had my sort of like aha moment, I should pursue my dreams, have the light turn on in my eyes, because the mystery of life is you never know when it's going to end. Deutsche Bank was in the World Trade Center? It was right across to World Trade, yeah, and my subway stop every morning was to World Trade, yeah. So suddenly you start like several businesses, the, a wild pizza restaurant? Yeah, that was the first business and it came out of a stomach ache. And so, you know, my mother always said necessity is the mother of invention. And so the first business was born out of a stomach ache. And so uh, we, I, I created a, a, a restaurant concept called, uh, well, it was called Slice, now it's called Wild. And it's a farm to table, gluten free alternative pizza place. Uh, I have two in Successful? New York. Successful? Yeah, I have two in New York, one in downtown Las Vegas, and they're doing well. More to come. Also, Sesame Street for vegetables? What's that? <laughs> so the Super Sprouts was actually born out of a menu in the restaurant. Um, so my twin sister is a sort of an artist and a creative, and she designed uh, a menu to get kids excited about eating vegetables, because kids always had just plain cheese pizza, no green stuff on their pizzas. So we had, uh, so she drew these vegetable characters that had superheroes, like Brian Broccoli was super strong, and Colby Carrot super sight, you know, based on the nutritional benefit of each character. And so, you know, kids immediately looked at that and said, I want to be like Brian Broccoli, ran to the counter, and ordered broccoli on their pizzas. And so really? immediately it was direct translation, yeah. So my sister kind of took it on and you know, we founded a company called Super Sprouts, which is like Sesame Street, but focusing on nutrition and wellness education. Yeah. And you're making money? Yeah, so reaching now over a million families a week. We have 14 products in the marketplace. We're at Whole Foods, at Wegmans, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. So yeah, it's and coming along. Entrepreneurship brings out the inventiveness in people for her business that promoting vegetables to kids, she somehow got the first lady of the United States to dance with her giant vegetables. Oh <laughs> my gosh, Michelle, oh! So how did you get her to do this? Because Michelle's all about the Let's Move initiative at the White House. Um, and so, you know, finally uh, she realized that, that our business is not going to fail and because it's now been around over three years. And so, she, so now they're, they're welcoming, welcoming our company uh, at the White House, which is awesome. Your third business, Thinks Underwear. Yeah, building a biz businesses and, and um, you know running in the city um, kept having you know monthly accidents when we have our periods and. 
and you know, you know, again, in this day and age of innovation, you know, how is it possible that we're still having accidents in our underwear, having to interrupt our day and run home and change? It just happens to every single girl all the time. And so I didn't know that. Well, I don't think women are daughter. supposed to know about this. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah. Well, all men are sitting here because of that normal time of the month. So without that, you would not be here. Um, but yeah. Okay. So we um, invented a company, uh, sort of a technology in women's underwear called Thinks, um, and uh, it it allows you know uh, in the underwear it's sort of we have the technology that makes it leak and stain resistant, absorbent, antimicrobial, moisture wicking that just supports women every day of the month for whatever kind of day they're having. And your whole group of entrepreneurs then moves on to the idea it's not enough for us to get rich. You want to save the world. <laughs> well, so I think, you know, we live in a really, really noisy world today. You know, we're getting advertised to by every kind of company in every kind of way. Um, it's in our news feed on Facebook, and it's just like, how do you get people excited about a business? And, it, you know, for us, you know, one thing that, A, allows people to continue to be excited is having a mission um, attached to the business. And also for me, as an entrepreneur, hustling every day, working so hard, and knowing that not only am I creating a product that, that supports me, but creating a product that supports girls around the world. What's the mission? Is, is, is great. So the mission is, um, right now in the developing world, over 100 million girls are missing a week of school because of their periods, and using unimaginable things like leaves and mud and plastic bags and old dirty rags to manage. And so um, we partnered up with an organization based in Uganda um, that produces washable, reusable cloth pads for girls. So for every pair of underwear that we sell here that solves a problem for girls here, we fund into the production of seven reusable cloth pads that goes to a girl in the developing world. And from these experiences, you have this book, Do Cool, yeah. I Can't. <laughs> um, yeah, here, there you go. And why do we need this? 56% of kids coming out of college today are unemployed or underemployed. And you know, when I was coming out of college um, and you know, coming at graduating from Cornell, I was fraught with student loan debt. Um, entrepreneurship wasn't an option for me, and so I went to investment banking because it had you know a strong paycheck, but I was miserable. It didn't really you know make me happy. And so, you know, the idea that entrepreneurship is a viable and vibrant option um, today is it was really is really exciting for a young graduate today. You know, with things like Kickstarter, Indiegogo and crowdfunding, things like that. And, and also, you know, now companies are, are funding kids who are in college, you know. It's easier? It's much easier, much easier to raise money. But to my previous guests say the American dream is gone. I, I regret, I disagree with that. Yeah, I very much disagree with that. All my friends who are in their 20s and 30s today are starting businesses. They're all creating value for the world. They're all, you know, one of my best friends, Taylor, found a company called Change Heroes that has helped build, you know, over 120 schools around it's the world. It's my impression that it's people your age that are doing all this. I was stunned to read this chart uh, from the Kauffman Foundation. Most small businesses are started by older people, people over... 55. Yeah, historically, the older generation would uh, be able to create businesses earlier or, or first because they have money, they've already built their careers, they already have, they have sort of establishment so they can, you know, manage their, they have resources to actually start something. Whereas today, again, with things like Kickstarter, with Indiegogo, with, you know, uh, with investors taking more risks than young people, I think the, the landscape has completely changed. Good. I hope you're right. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you. Coming up, my flailing attempts at starting businesses. And did you know that I actually started Facebook? Really? <laughs> Plus, more cool but risky businesses. What do you think is the most exciting thing about this bar? Uh, the price is going up and down. You can kind of play it like the stock market. One business that's clearly risky is the restaurant business. A third of new restaurants fail within a year. By year three, most fail. So entrepreneurs are always looking for something that will give them an edge, make them different, special. So how about this idea? A bar where the price of drinks changes based on supply and demand, like the stock market. The Exchange Bar and Grill tried this idea and it worked. Business grew. Since I heard Australians are big drinkers, I asked Reason TV's Naomi Brockwell to check the place out. What do you think is the most exciting thing about this bar? Uh, the price is going up and down. The bar is a ticker that shows the price of popular drinks. Bud, mystery beer, yeah, rum, whiskey, and so on. TV screens summarize the current prices. They change every five minutes based on supply and demand. When more people buy a drink, the price goes up. 
on a slow night, prices get cheaper. Anything in red, the price has gone down, so that means they haven't been ordered. But so I should be buying up all of these yes, right now. Yes. We get groups of people come in and, and, and try and play it. That's kind of what a lot of our draw is. You can kind of play it like the stock market. Let's say you come in and you order Bud Lights three, four times in a row, and your friends are ordering Bud Lights. If nobody's ordering Angry Orchard at that time, it might drop down, so you might be able to grab it at three dollars. If you're smart about it, you can play the market and you can. Um, go out for drinks for pretty cheap. If prices stay high and drinkers stop buying, bartenders may create a buying opportunity. I'm going to cause a market crash. We ring the bell, the whole market goes crazy. Everything drops. We have everything from $3, $4 house drinks, like $2 shots. You can really get a good deal on a drink if you catch it at the right time. It's very exciting. People realize, okay, your prices are going way low. Mm -hmm. So they like, you know, they all try to get an extra drink or two. Sometimes if uh, the bartender likes you, they might give you insider trading. Insider trading? What does she mean? You make friends with these bartenders. And then when you're about to leave, they give you a heads up, like, don't leave yet, because in 20 minutes, we're going to be dropping all the prices to $2 a beer. So then everyone stays, if you're friends. So it's uh, in your best interest to be a very nice patron. <laughs> so everybody thinks they have some gimmick that'll work. This one seems to be working. Yeah, it, it was a really fun place to visit. It's a, it's a great place to go if you're not that discerning about the type of drink that you want to consume. <laughs> one girl you interviewed talked about gaming the men. <laughs> yeah, mean? well, I mean, I asked her, I said, so how much was that drink that you just purchased? And she looked at me funny and signaled to the two men opposite her and said, well, I'm not checking the prices, I don't need to. So <laughs> she's, she's found out a better way to game the system, I think. <laughs> Now, the best gauge of how easy it is to start a business is how much economic freedom you have. Right. And there are rankings of countries. And your home country now has passed the United States it on has. the ranking. We used to be number two. We're now number 12. Australia is number three. How are things freer? Well, I mean, I think that the Australian government has really recognised that if you want to drive the economy, that you're going to have to encourage people to start businesses so that they can create jobs. And so they do a, a really good job at um, getting out of the way, allowing people the freedom to experiment, not giving them a bunch of paperwork to fill out before they're allowed to try something new. And I think that's what's really lacking in New York at the moment, in, in America. In New York, you tried to... Yeah, well, I'm, I'm CEO of my own production company, as well as working for the Moving Picture Institute. So I did start a business and it is very difficult. It is a lot more difficult than in Australia. So there just there's just a lot of hurdles just to jump. Just the hurdles the paperwork. Yeah. Thank you, Naomi Brock. Thank you very much. Coming up, I'll explain how I created Facebook. You thought it was Zuckerberg? Uh-uh. It's me. Did you know that I started Facebook? Really? When I was in college, I worked on the school newspaper. A few years before, the paper's editors published this snarky book filled with sexist stereotypes about the women at girls' schools. Princeton was all male at the time, so we students dated girls from schools like Wellesley, Bryn Mawr, Vassar, and so on. And it was fun to read generalizations about those schools. Where the girls are was a big success made money. So several years later, I came up with the idea of doing a new version of the book, but adding pictures. At the time, every school gave away a booklet with every student's pictures, so I just had to go to those schools and get administrators' permission to use the pictures. And for some reason, they gave it to me. We then published Who the Girls Are. It was little more than short, obnoxious generalizations about certain girls' schools, followed by pages and pages of freshman pictures. Now, you may not know this, but that's pretty much how Facebook started, with pictures of college women posted online so sexist college boys could see who appealed to them. We're ranking girls. You mean other students? Yeah. People want to go on the internet and check out their friends. That's what the Facebook is going to be about. And Facebook's now worth about $150 billion. Unfortunately, when I started my Facebook, the internet hadn't been invented yet. So there was no instant feedback, and my idea went nowhere. The book didn't even sell well. We lost money on it. Oh, well. Since then, I've failed again, failed at several other businesses. I have a copy of Give Me a Break. 
I'm told it's a wonderful book. Okay, most were stunts for TV. Like this Stossel store in Delaware where I tried to sell my books and Fox stuff. You want to buy Fox t-shirt? Not right now. The Stossel store failed, so did Stossel Enterprises in Hong Kong, and so did my New York City lemonade stand. But this ability to at least try to succeed is a reason America has been successful. In America, it's okay to fail and fail and try again. In most of Europe and much of the world, the attitude is, oh, you failed? You've had your shot. You didn't succeed, now go work for someone else. But this limits the possibilities. And some of America's biggest successes came from people who failed often. By reason of experiments with the telephone... Thomas Edison had more than a thousand patents. We know about his successes, like the light bulb. But few people know that Edison failed much more often. He was fired by the telegraph office, and he lost money in a cement company and an iron business. Henry Ford's first company failed completely. Dr. Seuss's first book was rejected by 27 publishers. Oprah was fired from her first job as a reporter. A TV station called her unfit for TV. So the moral to the story, go ahead and try something. It often brings money and happiness. Happiness researchers say people who work for themselves tend to be happier than the rest of us. They work longer, but they're happier. Now, all business is risky. Your first attempt probably will fail, but that adventure and that ability to try something and try again is what gives people the power to prosper. That's our show. See you next week.